Well, uh, thank you, President, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm good. Uh, oh, it's evening, isn't it? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. You know, I'm really happy to be back at the Oxford Union. Um, you've had some huge, influential names address you since I was last here four years ago. Uh, not least Bernie Sanders. Might be slightly before some of you were here then. It was Twenty. 17, I think Bernie did, and uh, his presidential campaign then and now has uh, been something to behold. U.S. political uh, presidential elections have never seen anything quite like it, and he concluded his speech to you on that particular occasion with a plea for hope and a call to arms. Uh, we need your energy, your enthusiasm, we need your courage, he said. And in talking this evening about trade unionism and the labour movement, that's a call worth repeating because I'm convinced that trade unions are needed now more than ever to represent and unite people in what is becoming an increasingly divided society. It would be wrong of me not to admit this evening that the hope and enthusiasm that I felt the last time I was here, just months after Jeremy Corbyn uh, was elected leader of the Labour Party, have given way to bitter disappointments. But while the sense of defeatism and demoralisation is inevitable, I see it as my role to shake off that particular feeling and to work to build a movement that wins for working people, whatever the government is in power. You are, of course, members of the Oxford Union and probably the Student Union. Some of you I know are members of the Labour Party. But I imagine very few of you are trade union members. So I hope tonight that I can convince you, whatever jobs you do or are likely to do in the future, uh, to become trade unionists. I grew up in Liverpool, you can tell by the accent. A proud trade union city. Uh, when I was a teenager, I knew what trade unions were. Uh, I joined on the first day I went to work on the Liverpool docks, the Transport and General Workers Union. But when I go back to my home city now, young people struggle to explain what unions are. And when I go to many other cities, uh, they really don't have a clue. And that's not really surprising, because even though trade unions are the largest voluntary sector body largest voluntary body in our society. Their history and purpose feature nowhere on the school national curriculum. I always say that this is why we must tell our own story and fight for our own justice. So forgive me while I give you a very short, a very short trade union history, because it is my contention that trade unions have always been a force for good. And it's important to know where we came from and what we've achieved. Last August 2019 marked the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo Massacre. Some of you may have seen Mike Lee's epic film of the brutal crushing of peaceful protesters standing up for democracy and economic and political freedom. This was the moment when our journey to working class representation and respect began. I can trace the development of trade unions from that moment. The Tolpuddle Martyrs, some of you may have heard of it, perhaps the best known early pioneers of trade unions and workers' rights. In 1836, six agricultural workers in the Dorset village of Tolpuddle did nothing more revolutionary than create a friendly society of agricultural labourers because their wages had been steadily falling. And because trade unions were illegal, friendly societies started to be formed locally as underground groups concerned with providing social benefits. But because the Tolpuddle Martyrs dared to demand the pay rise, they were charged with taking an illegal oath and they were sent to Australia. Quite incredible, their real crime, of course, in the eyes of their landed masters, was attempting to form a trade union. It was the Chartist movement 
in the 1840s that laid the foundations of our modern labour movement today with their charter of six electoral reforms end at, uh, aimed at extending the franchise and enabling working men, working men, women had to wait a little longer to be elected to Parliament. This led direct, directly to protests in demand of improving working conditions, such as restricting the working hours of women and young children in the textile mills to 10 hours a day. They used to work 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And that campaign victory galvanized the unions into further organization in 1868. The Trade Union Congress was formed. And in 1871, trade unions became legal. I won't go much further into the history lesson. You can read it in my book um, if you ever get a chance. Uh, but it was this increasing strength and confidence of the trade unions towards the end of the 19th century, along with a series of events which convinced them that the Liberal Party would never speak for working people. Before that, it was the Liberals that trade unions turned to. And that led to the establishment of the Labour Party to give workers a voice in Parliament and to pass legislation to improve workers' lives. You'll hear arguments of people saying, why is the Labour Party, why are trade unions involved in the Labour Party? Well, that's why we created the Party of Labour, so that we had a voice in the political arena. Trade unions have always been, I like to say, on the side of the angels, right throughout history, fighting against slavery, against child labour, fighting for women's suffrage, fighting against fascism and against anti-Semitism and campaigning for women's rights and equal pay. I wonder sometimes with horror what our society would be like today without trade unions. And that takes me to the theme of this lecture. Are we a force for good or a hindrance to the economy? Successive governments from Thatcher onwards have sought to shackle unions with anti-union, anti-worker legislation and cut us out of all the major conversations about the economy industrial strategy and production. That's even though our sister unions in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, with much more successful economies than ours, are very much seated at the table. Productivity increases when companies engage with us, as can be seen in the German model of co-determination and in our own experiences, sitting down with our automotive industry employers as an example, to work together to solve productivity issues. Because 95% of the time of trade unions is spent resolving often complex issues that an employer cannot solve by themselves. Unions are central to our democracy, not an obstacle to it. The iconic mini car plants just down the road at Cowley needed to bring forward essential work in 2018 because of the looming threat of a no-deal Brexit. And it was Unite and our shop stewards that assisted in that process. It couldn't have been achieved without them. When Jaguar Land Rover made its welcome announcement of investment in the new electro uh, electric vehicle, the firm sat down with us in order to reach an agreement that not only gave production workers in the Castle Bromwich plants a better work-life balance, but also gave the car maker greater flexibility that protected its profits and its competitive nature. Tripartite meetings between government, employers and unions are the norm in Germany, France and other European countries. And yet, you know, the first Tory Prime Minister I spoke to since Thatcher decreed that no Conservative Prime Minister should talk to the unions was Theresa May. So no conversation with John Major or David Cameron. And only then, when Mrs May knew her days were numbered and her Brexit deal was liable to fail, did she pick the phone up to speak to me and meet with me and also some other general secretaries. I wrote to both George Osborne and Philip Hammond when they were chancellors, urging dialogue with us as the representatives of millions of workers 
on how to address the challenge of falling productivity in the UK economy. Neither ever bothered to respond. Again, in the rest of Europe, governments wouldn't dream of excluding trade unions from a debate of that nature relating to the con economy. And Thatcher's, Thatcher's characterization of unions that we were the enemy within would be laughable if it wasn't still the way the state and the mainstream media views us. It demonstrated a deep vindictiveness towards ordinary working people, their industries and their unions, because trade unions are simply organisations that bring people together to make their lives better by winning better pay, ensuring safer and more inclusive workplaces and providing access to skills, education and training. Trade unions look out for each other and when a group of workers act and speak together, their employer has to listen. Ultimately, trade unions put equality at work and in our civil society front and centre, campaigning for an end to discrimination, to inequality in wages and in power. So why then, if trade unions achieve and provide all these great things, and given it's a fact that workers in unionised workplaces are safer and higher paid than non-union workplaces, are we either vilified by politicians and the mainstream media whenever we seek to defend our members, or we're portrayed as irrelevant dinosaurs of the 1970s. You know, I get angry when I think of the fact that this very nation of ours, having defeated fascism at the end of the Second World War, and gave Europe all of the freedoms that they currently enjoy, how is it right that German workers, Italian workers, Spanish, French, and all the rest of them I've got better protections than British workers. It is just simply wrong. And why did David Cameron introduce the Trade Union Act, which further restricted the ability of trade union members to stand up for themselves? Even the senior Tory MP, David David, described its proposed restrictions on pickets as like something out of Franco's dictatorship in Spain. The reason, of course, is right there in what we achieve for working people. Trade unions are the first and last line of defence for workers against the power and might of unrestrained capital and bad bosses. The right-wing press describes the 1970s as dark days, but lots of progressive things happened in the 1970s. The Equal Pay Act was introduced. The Health and Safety at Work Act, which has literally saved tens of thousands of workers' lives, was introduced. And during the 1970s, living standards took great strides forward for millions of people. It was the 1980s that started the downward spiral, as well as the anti-trade unions, the dramatic, the dramatic changes the Tories made during the 80s to our rights to negotiate paying conditions on behalf of our members, known as collective bargaining, made it much more difficult to organise workers on a sectoral basis. The result was that by 1990, collective bargaining coverage had fallen to 55% from around 70%. By the turn of the millennium, only one in three workers were covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Now ask yourself the question, who benefited from that? It certainly wasn't the workers. It's no accident that the workers' share of GDP, the wealth that we create in Britain, the money that goes into the back pockets of workers through salaries and wages, it's no accident that that has fallen from a high of almost 65% in the 1980s to around 51% today. And by the way, that's not money that's vanished. It's just gone to those who already have it, the corporate elite, the super rich. Any A-level economic student, and there'll be budding economic, uh, economists here to, tonight, could tell you the devastating impact that that has on sustainable growth being achieved in our economy. The strategy was part and parcel of a deliberate drive 
towards deindustrialization, deunionized, flexible service sector economy. Under Margaret Thatcher, it was like a car boot sale here in the UK. When foreign companies were allowed to come in, buy up British companies, this very view of our major companies now owned by British firms. Uh, and most of them were then closed down because it was cheaper and easier to sack British workers. Under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's governments, we lost a further one million manufacturing jobs. It's not really surprising then that young workers in particular have formed the impression that unions do not or cannot represent them. But that's not true. The fact is trade unions continually adapt and modernize to deal with the precarious nature of much of today's world of work. Now I imagine that not many of you are planning your future careers as Deliveroo or Uber Eat couriers or forever waiting tables at Peter Express. Perhaps some of you are doing those jobs while you're studying and that's fine. But most of the millions of people working in insecure jobs on zero hour contracts have little choice but to be subjected to such uncertainty. They want proper wages and an employment contract that gives them rights, which is why they need a trade union and why collective action is needed. Back in 2018, fast food couriers brought parts of central London to a standstill, riding en masse on their scooters in demand of an increased minimum payment for deliveries. The TGI Fridays, a well-known restaurant chain dispute, gave the lie to the assumption that there is no point in joining a trade union if you're young, working in the precarious gig economy, and if your employer doesn't recognize your union. The waiters and waitresses were sick of having their card tips taken by their employer, and a handful decided to join Unite and recruit others. They swiftly realized that there is power in numbers. And it turned out that they were confident enough to win support for strike action. They were joined uh, by staff in the pub chain Weatherspoons and by McDonald's demanding an end to zero hour contracts, low pay and youth rates. And together they recruited, organized, mobilized and walked out. They became trade unionists in order to win their collective rights. And while they didn't achieve everything, they won significant parts of their demands. Young people standing together. If we return to that word relevance and the importance of trade unions being relevant to the modern world of work and the communities people live in, we also have to challenge the view that unions are only interested in workers in work, concerned only to protect jobs and secure better pay for our members. As important as that is, in fact, it's vital. But we must give a voice to communities and re-engage with them. You know, there was a time when trade unions and trade unions traditionally were at the heart of their communities. But 40 years of deindustrialization, the decimation of our traditional manufacturing industries has broken the links between unions and communities. This fracturing has undoubtedly resulted in the decline of community cohesion, and the impact of austerity in towns that have lost their industries has been far harsher as a result. As I was watching and experiencing this, it made me increasingly determined to do something to try and re-engage and reconnect unions with communities, to give a voice to those increasingly left behind. And so I set up Unite Community to enable those not in work to join our union family from 16 to 116. Unite Community, which costs as little as 55p a week, was open to anyone who hasn't got a job and has extended our reach into the marginalized communities, largely deserted by politicians and conventional trade unionism. It's been fundamental in our union's political response to the austerity and cuts that we've been experiencing, including being at the forefront of national campaigns against universal credit and the hated bedroom tax. Unite community members were also involved in the immediate response to the Grenfell tragedy, supporting our members and families 
and members who died there. Three Unite members died in that disaster. And those of you who are aware of the Sports Direct campaign in which we expose Mike Ashley's shameful and abusive work practices, ultimately forcing him to scrap zero-hour contracts, should know that it was our community members who were at the front and centre of that. Incidentally, Weatherspoons quickly followed suit and scrapped their zero-hour contracts. Now, I mentioned earlier that trade unions don't feature at all on the school curriculum. Even though we've played a central role in history of our nations and in securing the rights that most of you will take for granted when you start working. Equal pay, the national minimum wage, pension rights, family-friendly policies, maternity and paternity leave, holiday pay, holidays themselves and much more. That was one of the reasons why I came to write my book about why people should be trade unions, should be proud to know what we try to do. Young people are the most likely to be exploited early on in the world of work, and yet they enter it knowing next to nothing about what trade unions do and how unions can protect them and help them to stand up to the greedy bosses who will take advantage of them. It's why I'm passionate in my belief that learning should include teaching in schools about the role of trade unions in workplaces, communities, and wider society. And why we set up our Unite in Schools initiative, which goes into schools to speak to 15 and 16 year olds about what trade unionism is. Inevitably, when I set it up, the Sun newspaper accused me of wanting to recruit kids into Unite in order to brainwash them and start a revolution from the classrooms. It was nothing of the sort. We simply wanted to explain what unions are and facilitate debate about the role they play, about the rights and responsibilities we all have and the need to understand the concept of collectivism if they are to do anything about what's happening in their life. President Beith, finally, just let me touch upon the general election. I know that we're going to touch upon it in the question and answer session. I'm looking forward to that. I knew Labour wouldn't win as election day grew closer, I was predicting that Boris Johnson would win a workable majority. It had become evident uh, to me that Labour's slide into being a perceived Remain party was, to go was going to give us some real problems in our northern and midland heartlands. There was a feeling of betrayal over Brexit. I've been trying for over a year to stop the Labour leadership from allowing the party to be pushed to abandon our 2017 general election pledges. It's important when we talk about that, that you keep 2017, two and a half years ago, in the back of your mind. We'd gone then to the electorate on the basis of respecting the 2016 referendum and pledging to take us out of the European Union if we'd won. We should have stuck with that while setting about winning over Remainers, and I suspect most of you in this audience will be Remainers. The truth is that Jeremy was in some difficulty. The vast majority of Labour Party members, 75% of them, especially young people, were Remainers. Why would you not be? Incidentally, my union campaigned strongly for Remain in 2016. And we should have been explaining to Remainers that we would negotiate a deal that would allay their fears. We'd negotiate a deal to take us out of the EU that would protect jobs and investment and that they could feel relatively com comfortable about. And in the end, we ended up with a policy uh, with those heart which those heartlands saw as at best trying to kick Brexit down the road and at worst trying to stop Brexit altogether, trying to disregard their democratic vote. And we paid the consequences of the 60 seats Labour lost in December. 52 of them were leave seats and only eight were remain. Six of them were in Scotland and we lost them for a different reason. There has been endless analysis insisting it was Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and our policies that did it for us and much, much more than Brexit did. It's true that Jeremy was unpopular on the doorstep in many of our working class areas. He was relentlessly vilified by the media 
and it was seen as weak. But taken in isolation, our policies were popular and all the subsequent polling has showed that. But what happened is, in an attempt to break through Brexit, Labour produced a manifesto which had far too many promises in the desperate hope that people would push Brexit to one side. Our own polling of our members, our Unite members are a microcosm of our nation, tells us that policies themselves, particularly nationalisation of our railways, our Royal Mail, and real investments in the NHS and the abolition of zero-hour contracts, £10 minimum wage, regional investment banks to redistribute wealth, were liked. But there was too many of them and not enough focus. Labour's credibility was damaged. Many believed they could not deliver. Trust was broken. So I stick with my conviction that it was Brexit that lost it for us in not only creating a divided party and creating a fundamental disconnect between Labour and its heartlands, but in fueling the perception that Jeremy Corbyn was not a strong leader and causing people to disbelieve the credibility of pledges that only two years previously they'd seen and were prepared to embrace enthusiastically and which brought us so close to the threshold of power. I'll finish on this. There has long been a debate about whether you can have power without principles or whether principles are more important than power. Well, I believe in what I call principle pragmatism, and that means being sufficiently pragmatic to move on issues that don't undermine your basic principles, creating unity and seeking common ground. Whilst I'm talking about principles, I think all of the current candidates should uh, make it known and declare where their funding for their campaigns are coming from. Rebecca has already done that, and I hope Kira and Lisa can do the same. And I'm convinced that no matter which of the candidates becomes Labour leader, that Jeremy Corbyn has changed the Labour Party forever, and that in four years' time, we will again offer a radical alternative uh, solution to the problems. We'll give real hope to working people and communities. We'll win back those red wall seats and be a credible party of government once more. And trade unionists will be at the heart of it. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much for that talk. I want to start off with a couple of the issues that you raised in it, and then we'll move on to talking about modern labour, which I'm sure is what everyone's waiting to hear. Um, but you were talked a little bit about trade unions as sort of simply organisations that bring workers together, and you gave great examples of the work that trade unions have done throughout modern history to do that. But it strikes me that modern trade unions, and I think particularly Unite, and particularly with you in your role as General Secretary, seem to be much more overtly political and much more present on you know, the Sunday political programmes, the Today Show, whatever it is, <coughs> almost acting as surrogates for Labour politicians, being politicians yourselves. How do you think you balance <coughs> this kind of historical duty that you have and the reason you exist to organise for workers and to help workers organise with this kind of role on the political well, stage? It, it's a good question. And I know that's a perception that is um, given by the media. And as you rightly say, it's given by me when I appear on so many uh, uh, TV political programmes. The truth of the matter is that 95% of my time is dealt with industrial issues, mm -hmm. dealing with all of the major manufacturing companies in, this, uh, in, in our country and the running of a union that has 1.3 million members, the diversity of which takes my breath away. You can't think of a single job where we don't have a Unite member, and you can't think of a single town, almost village, in the whole of the UK <laughs> where Unite doesn't have a presence. So running an organisation like that absorbs all of my time. But of course, I'm involved in political issues, and that's what the media pick up on. They're not interested what I'm doing on the industrial front. I talked about how my members, Unite members, are involved constantly in complex mm -hmm. issues. I remember David Cameron used to mention my name at, uh, 
a question time almost oh. every week. I was expecting an invite to his Christmas party. But uh, the reality is he also praised the automotive workers. Little did he know that 100% of those automotive sector workers are Unite members who are engaged in trying to uh, promote their company and productivity and make the company profitable and competitive. And that's what I do most of the time. You never hear the newspapers talk good stories. Of the only stories they'll touch in terms of the industrial side is when we're on strike. That's the big mm -hmm. issue. Strike, 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 strike. Given the impression to the public that that's all the unions are, hence the title of the lecture, uh, are we a hindrance to the economy? The answer to that when you examine it closely is absolutely emphatically no. Mm. But the image the media would give you is, is somewhat different. But I also mentioned uh, the, uh, that it was the trade unions who created the Labour Party. Mm. Now, there is a view that says, oh, trade unions shouldn't have anything to do with Labour Party. Let the Labour Party and politicians get on with it. We created it. It is our party. Trade unions back in the, um, in the uh, 18th century used to be affiliated to the Liberal Party. And as I said, it became evident that they would always sell you down the river. They were the other side of the same Tory coin. And... Labour was created, so we are part of Labour. If you think about it, everything we do in life is dictated by politics. All of the industrial work that I'm personally involved in is dictated by politics. The involvement I have um, in the political arena is not just with the Labour Party. I had a very good relationship, for example, with... Um, uh, with Greg Clark when he was business secretary. We did a lot of good work together, securing jobs uh, um, in, in, in our nation. I have had a number of meetings with uh, Sajid Javid and you know the various uh, government ministers to talk about industrial issues because, of course, everything we do is dictated by politics. The current anti-union laws, mm -hmm. uh, which were introduced by Margaret Thatcher in, in 1980, and there's been a salami type approach from consecutive Tory governments, weaken workers' positions. I, I, I made that emotive issue about how can it be that German workers and all the other workers in the rest of Europe have got better protections. Now, the only way I can change that is in the political arena, influencing the Labour Party to adopt policies that if they got into power, uh, they could change it. So I make no apologies for engaging in uh, the political arena. We're the largest affiliate to the Labour Party. Uh, we put more money in than anybody else. My members would be annoyed if I didn't have an influence, if I wasn't getting something out of that uh, support. Um, but it is a false I I impression to think that I spend all my time. Absolutely. But if that's your approach, what do you do when you're in a position like I suppose many perceive the left as being in Britain now, essentially in crisis. Is that, is that how you view the left right now? Do you think that it is go undergoing some sort of existential difficulty and divisions that it isn't doing a very good job, it would seem, remedying? Or do you think it's just part and parcel of infighting and people should just unite? Yeah. I, I, I've, uh, I've been a member of the Labour Party uh, 50 years and uh, the left seems to have been in crisis all of that time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on the left uh, unashamedly and I've constantly found myself uh, in the minority mm -hmm. and arguing for uh, more radical policies than at the time was uh, embraced by the leadership of the Labour Party. So. I was quite delighted when Jeremy Corbyn um, was, uh, um, was elected uh, because I felt that there was an opportunity to present an alternative. I think him and John MacDonald have done a great job in trying to create an economic alternative uh, to challenge uh, neoliberalism, this powerful uh, economic force that has strode the globe for 40 years. They are the only ones that have ever chanced it. It's where Tony Blair and, and Gordon Brown failed. Uh, you know, I'm not someone who just slags off New Labour for the sake of it. New Labour introduced uh, lots of good things, especially in civil society. 
but they didn't challenge uh, the uh, privilege and the establishment, which is why under them 13 years of a, a Labour government, um, uh, inequality grew. Uh, now, that's not what you want from a Labour, a, a Labour government. And so when Jeremy Corbyn was elected, I felt there was, it was an opportunity to see if we could offer the electorate mm -hmm. uh, an alternative. I think that was good for democracy because how many times did we hear people say all, all these politicians are the same? Mm -hmm. Well, suddenly Corbyn and Macdonald said, no, we're not, here's an alternative. Mm -hmm. Now, you then have to win sufficient electors to to come into power. Um, and are we now currently in another one of those crises? We probably are because we've suffered a major defeat, a massive defeat. Mm. And so now the debate will be, well, was it part, was it the left and all of these wild, hard left uh, uh, policies and shouldn't we ditch them and shouldn't we go back into the center ground again? And the left are, on the back foot and you know for me and i was saying to a, a couple of your colleagues when i was chatting to them before there's a demoralization Four hundred thousand people joined the labor party when corbyn became leader an awful lot of them young people and they'll feel demoralized at the moment they'll feel let down at the moment and so our message those of us that have seen this before has got to be, look, you join the Labour Party because of the values of wanting a better Britain, a more peaceful world. We still need that. So let's get over the defeat and let's battle backwards. And so, yeah, we are in that period of <coughs> licking our wounds and trying to shake it off and get back to fighting for a cause. I'll, I'll just make this quick point. It was Harold Wilson a Labour leader who incidentally won four general elections. Um, and he was an MP in my city, Liverpool, who once said that if Labour is not a cause, then we are nothing. And it struck me as being 100% correct at that time. And I've never moved away from that. Labour has to be a cause mm -hmm. for a better world, a better Britain, a more equal society. And that's where I think we've got to enthuse people to continue to fight for. Then for you as someone who I think is seen as a sort of spokesperson for the kind of left that Corbyn represented or represents, why did why was Labour defeated so badly? Well, Brexit, uh, undoubtedly Brexit. And without me repeating some of the stuff mm. I said and, and, and going on too long, let me just give you one fact. Anybody who tries to tell you no, it wasn't Brexit. And of course, the right wing and the right wing media and the right wing, the Labour Party are now saying, no, it wasn't just Brexit. It was about Corbyn and these left wing policies that lost it. No, it wasn't. In 2017, I asked you to keep that in the back of your mind. We went to the electorate then with a radical manifesto at a time when Labour was supposed to be destroyed. That's why Theresa May called a snap election. And we came within touch and distance mm -hmm. of power. It wasn't the policies. It was because of the betrayal people felt in our heartlands. And the one statistic that you should that I lay down to uh, present my, my 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 thesis as as undeniable. Boris Johnson and the Conservatives have just won forty four percent of the popular vote. Forty four percent. Those of you who are studying PPE will know that in a political sense, that is a dramatic victory, 44%. And they won it with one policy, get Brexit done. Boris Johnson may have said something about police and a bit about the National Health Service, but all he said was get Brexit done. It was about Brexit, this election. And that's where Labour, because of poor leadership, allowed the nation to believe that we were divided, not given clear mm -hmm. leadership, and that we were betrayed. But if, it, if we accept that it was Brexit last year, in 2017, Labour may have come closer to power than it was, but obviously still didn't win the general election. Is there something <laughs> about the way in which the party, I suppose, has continued to infight for the past several yeah. years, 
that has put it in that position? Do you think it's about the sort of ideological direction of the leadership? Do you think it's about weak leadership like you suggested? Or do you think it's something completely separate? Do you think it's people working to undermine leadership? Yeah, well, a, a great question. Let me take you back to 2017 because, yeah, we didn't win power. Um, and when I say we came within touching, touching distance, if the Conservative Party had have lost five more seats, and I could name the five seats for you and show you how close the margins were, if they'd have lost those five seats, Jeremy Corbyn would have gone in to 10 Downing Street. That's how close we came. And that was against the background of him not only being vilified in the most despicable way by the right-wing media day in, day out, but was, it was also about the disgraceful attacks that were launched on him by Labour Party uh, MPs. Remember, 172 members of the Parliamentary Labour Party moved a vote to no confidence in him. Uh, they challenged him, having only just won the election for leader with a landslide victory. Um, they challenged him once again uh, in less than a year. In less than a year, they challenged him again. Quite despicable. It's why Theresa May, who said she would never call uh, a, a quick election, decided, uh, uh, advisors said to her, of course you've got to call an election. This fella is dead in the water. Just imagine if Labour had have given the impression of being a united party, of being behind Jeremy. Those Labour MPs, in fact, one of them is my MP in, uh, in, in the constituency where I live, Neil Coyle. I used to say to Neil, it's as though you wake up and the first thing you do every single morning is say, now what can I hit Jeremy Corbyn over the head with today? And there was a whole plethora of right-wing uh, Labour MPs who were prepared to do that. And of course, the right-wing media were more than delighted to give them a platform. Mm -hmm. Imagine if that had been a, uni a, a unified party supporting Jeremy and saying, well, OK, we're going to give you a chance. I think, well, I don't think Theresa May would have called an mm -hmm. election. But all of this suggests that the criticisms levelled against Corbyn from inside the party, which really like have continued, essentially aren't legitimate. And I know you've described in the past, um, especially on the issue of anti-Semitism, for instance, parties, uh, sorry, members, MPs working overtime to kind of undermine Corbyn on this issue. But do you not think that with so many people complaining about these issues over such a long time, whether it's anti-Semitism or whether it's other issues of leadership, that there's surely some legitimacy in MPs opposing Corbyn on that basis? No, I think it. I think the level and the nature was undemocratic. Of course, we live in a, a democracy and people should be able to raise their concerns, challenge leaders. In my union, I encourage my members and my activists to challenge me if they think I'm wrong, and often uh, they'll do that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's the nature in which it was done. He was never given a chance, despite the fact that he won a landslide victory. The members of the Labour Party voted overwhelmingly that they wanted Jeremy as their leader. I wrote an article in The Guardian at the time that said that we are all on a learning curve. The PLP need to learn that they are now representatives of a different Labour Party, of a Labour Party that has changed, full of young people demanding cha change. I also said that Jeremy Corbyn was on a, a, a learning curve, learning to be a leader, because for 30 odd years he's been a backbencher, uh, concerned with issues, being able to say what he liked about those issues, uh, knowing that if anybody wanted to criticise him, well, he would take the criticism. He had to learn that he could no longer do that, that he was now a leader, and therefore he had to understand the nuances of leadership. So it's the nature of how you pose that mm -hmm. criticism. I had criticisms of Ed Miliband, or certainly of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in my time in senior office, but I would hope that the criticism I levelled was constructive criticism in the first instance and didn't have this avalanche of vilification that was the, the Parliamentary Labour Party. But if 
those MPs' duty is to listen to Labour members. Surely it's also their duty to get their party elected, to win their own seats, to win the general election. Well, they... And if they perceive issues, whether it's things in 2017 or things now, which they think are going to stop Labour from winning an election, going to see Labour defeated in the way that it was last year, is it not their duty to work against that? Well, of course, if you remember, this was prior to 2017. Uh, and they didn't go about it in the right way. Had they have behaved in a manner that was an acceptable way, uh, then Labour would have won the 2017 election, not get defeated by it. It was their behaviour that weakened the position of Labour going into the 2017 election. And that's my mm -hmm. criticism. They also, it's why a number of constituency Labour parties then wanted to deselect these MPs which created more and more uh, um, division in the party. It's why a number of Labour MPs ultimately left the party because a number of those knew that they were going to be deselected. So the whole thing was spiralled downwards and there's no doubt that their behaviour uh, was something that frankly uh, was damaging to the Labour Party and has led to where we are. Criticism, perfectly right to criticise. Criticism over anti-Semitism, if it's genuine, perfectly correct that it should be called out. But the manner in which you do that and the manner in which you conduct yourself is uh, essential. So just to move on quickly to the Labour Party leadership contest before we open it up to the audience, Unite has obviously endorsed Rebecca Long-Bailey um, and Richard Bergen in the ongoing leadership contest. Can you tell me a bit more about these two endorsements and the decisions that went on in that all-day yeah. meeting that decided them? Yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, the three candidates, Kia, Lisa and, and, and Becky, are all excellent individuals. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you can only choose one. You don't have... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, both myself and, and my executive, and we had a hustings, fantastic hustings. Both the leadership uh, leaders and the deputy leader candidates were all excellent. Um, and you have to make a judgment now, in my mind, um, and again, I was talking to colleagues about this, uh, uh, one of them who decided they want to support Kia. Um, I've got his name and we'll be visiting him later. Um, uh, was making the point that uh, they want a leader, they want to win, they want to win the next election. Mm -hmm. And I understand that argument and it is about how can you win back our heartlands in the Midlands and um, in the North, which voice can best win that back um, and which voice has got a belief in continuing the road of a radical alternative Labour Party. And uh, my judgment is that Rebecca Long-Bailey is best placed to do that. She is um, somebody who's very courageous and very capable. I've worked with Becky on her green um, manufacturing uh, uh, deal. Now, the, the green new deal for manufacturing uh, embraces both the issue of climate change, which of course is so important, especially in the minds of young people, and also the question of uh, sustainable alternatives, real, well-paid, decent manufacturing jobs. She's been brilliant on that. Uh, she's courageous enough to kind of deal with, on the one hand, um, Labour is seen as the party that looks after or cares more about low-paid, poor, vulnerable, um, mentally Ill, Ill, homeless, we're seen as the party mm -hmm. of that. And that's a good thing. And Jeremy Corbyn in particular was committed to those causes. But the vast majority of our nation don't fit into any of those mm -hmm. categories. And Becky is somebody who's talked about aspirational socialism. What does that mean? Well, it means saying to people out there who've got a job, maybe a decent paid job, and live in a, 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 a reasonable, <laughs> nice house, but who still have aspirations, especially for the children, that Labour is their party as well. And she's the one to me that is able to build that red bridge, if you like, between, on the one hand, the metropolitan cities where a lot of young people, students, uh, professionals of 
of, of joined labour and our heartlands mm. in the forgotten towns and, uh, and cities uh, and can talk to them. And so that's the judgment. There's also an issue about loyalty. Um, uh, she was the only one mm. who stayed loyal to Corbyn during the difficult attacks that were going on inside the party. Uh, both Lisa and uh, Kia resigned. Mm. Um, Lisa, the um, you know a close friend of, have been for over ten years. I uh, uh, I was <laughs> I was angry with her when she did that, and um, and uh, you know I've been angry with her a few times since. Now she sees me. She says, "Lenny, for God's sake, don't attack me over what I did then. I did it for a reason." She's got an answer, but loyalty is an important thing, and. In working class areas, loyalty has some deep roots, and so we chose uh, we chose um, uh, Becky. As much as I'd love to respond to that, I think it's time to open it up to the audience. So, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, wait for a mic to come to you and stand up when it does arrive. So, in the puffer in the fourth row, that's you looking around. <laughs> Hi, <coughs> I think you've made your opinion on Brexit pretty clear. Um, I was just wondering, in the years leading up to the change in Labour policy, why do you think you lost the argument on a second referendum? And what would you do differently to try to win that argument with Labour members? Well, I think uh, with Labour members, let's just uh, revert backwards. I, I think I mentioned that uh, a poll was done and about 70 percent, it might have been as high as 75 percent of Labour members were Remainers wanted to remain. And Jeremy Corbyn uh, was effectively put into leadership by these members, which is why he felt awkward about challenging this slide into uh, being perceived as a Remain party. Um, what would I do? What would I do differently? It's difficult. It's difficult to say because I fought very hard privately with Jeremy and John Mack to be careful about sliding into perception. If you look at Labour's policy at the election, we actually weren't a Remain party, but we were perceived as that. The likes of Keir and Emily Thornberry wanted us to be an out-and-out -out Remain party. And some of the influences that I had um, during the course of these private meetings uh, stopped that happening and we ended up with this position where the actual party policy was if we get into government we will respect the 2016 <laughs> referendum and we will negotiate an exit from the European Union but we will then put it back uh, to a second uh, vote and on that second vote would be the option to remain. Now, it was a compromised position to try and demonstrate in our heartlands in particular, because I knew what was happening in our heartlands. I went to the Jaguar Land Rover plants in, in Solihull, uh, where my senior stewards, there's 15,000 workers there, all Unite members. My senior stewards were telling me, Lenny, nearly 70%, 80% of our members voted to leave, even though that would have damaged the Jaguar Land Rover plant. They, <clears throat> during the election campaign, they said, don't, this is the shop steward, don't ask us to go out onto the shop floor uh, asking people to vote Labour because they chase us. They are, there was some industrial language used, they, they, want nothing to do with Labour and nothing to do with Corbyn. It was extraordinary. Now, the problem was um, that could I have done any more than trying to persuade Jeremy and John? I don't know that I could have. If Jeremy had have accepted 2017, always go back to 2017, we went into the election on a platform of respecting the 2016 referendum, and we will take you out of the European Union. No second vote, no question of going for Remain again. If Jeremy had been brave enough to grasp that nettle 
the task there would have been to come to people like you, to, to come to our members who were Remainers, who believed Remain was the right thing, and try to win you over. Try to say, because although, say, 75% of our Labour Party members were uh, Remainers, probably 90% of them were pro-Corbyn. And Corbyn should have said to them, look, trust me, I know you want to remain, but we've lost the vote, trust me, stay with me. I'll negotiate a deal that when you see it, you will say, well, it's not what we wanted, but you know what, I feel comfortable about it. Protecting jobs, protecting investment, protecting all the alignments with environments and consumer alignments, protecting the movements of people. It, that's, what, that's what I believe Jeremy should have done. I'm disappointed that he didn't, because back to B's question, the, le the left are now in this terrible position of being on the back foot again. Right, we'll take a couple more if we can answer relatively briefly so we can get through <laughs> all of them. Um, just it's in okay, the middle it's only on the right. Past. We're, we're doing all right. Just in, in the scarf on the right. Do you want to pass it over? Thank you very much for coming. I've got a question about Brexit, the sources or the reasons for the um, victory of the Brexit referendum, of the Leave uh, um, victory, and especially the role of immigration rhetoric, uh, re sorry, rhetoric in this um, debate. Why do you think all these people on the shop floor, 70% voted for Leave? Was immigration an important uh, component of that? If it was, um, do you think Unite and other unions took that on enough in your battle? for Remain, and what is your position on the future of immigration in the UK? Thank you. Yeah, well, it, it's the, it's the $64,000 question, the thorny issue about, um, about immigration, or to be more precise, um, migrant workers. And what part did that play in the 2016 referendum? Well, I believe there were two major reasons why people voted to leave the European Union. One was the forgotten towns and cities that effectively was almost like a, a Monty Python uh, a sketch, you know, what has Europe ever done for us? Um, and there was a feeling of, of being left behind. There was a belief that this is an opportunity for us to kick uh, the metropolitan elite. Um, and the second reason was migrant labour. There is no doubt that the abuses um, that migrant workers have to suffer uh, by greedy bosses who in many parts of our nation use migrant labour to undercut pay and conditions uh, is appalling. Labour incidentally was the only party that had uh, policies for that. Um, and the truth of the matter is there are those that say, well, if you start talking like that, you play into the right-wing agenda of blaming immigrants. Now, I constantly go out of my way to say, I don't, immigrants are not to blame for a single thing in this, uh, in this world. The truth of the matter, though, is that if you don't deal with this issue, you leave a vacuum, and that vacuum is filled by the extreme right-wing to peddle their filth and their creed. The fact is, you have to blame greedy bosses, and the greedy bosses should be stopped. So that's why people uh, voted, those two main reasons. Now, Unite um, did more than anybody in terms of the referendum. We campaigned for Remain. We campaigned on a platform of Remain and Reform, because the idea that Europe is a panacea for working people is just plain wrong. The truth of the matter is that uh, the, the European Union has slipped backwards from the days of Delors, um, Jacques Delors, who, who, who promised the social contract. It slipped backwards. And, of course, Europe is at the very centre of austerity. Uh, look how they treated uh, the Greek nation. Look how they treated Ireland. So the idea that Europe is some panacea is just plain wrong. We argued for remain and reform, put more money and more resource, uh, resources than anyone. But I was telling your colleagues before, we asked the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, to give us more time. 
12 weeks he gave us for that campaign. 12 weeks. Cast your mind back to the independence referendum in, in Scotland. That debate went on for 18 months. 18 months, which meant that Scottish people in their homes, at work, in the pubs, talked about independence. And when the vote came, were fully aware of all of the information they needed to. You're quite right about the rhetoric and the misinformation that took place. And we wanted from David Cameron 12 months to have this campaign so that we could have got to our members and, um, and explained and destroyed some of the myths they had and put forward some of the other solutions. And unfortunately, uh, Cameron believed that they were going to win the referendum easily. And that's what brought us to where we are. The difficulty you've got is once you lose, the idea then that people come forward, uh, the Remain lobby was very well funded, and you've got people saying, no, uh, well, people didn't know what they were doing. You can imagine how that plays in working class heartlands that voted leave, people telling them that they didn't quite understand what they were doing. You can imagine how that played. People were furious about it, and I'd known that for a long time, which is why, going back to your question, we were trying to say to Jeremy and John, please be careful here. There's going to be consequences. And on immigration, of course, Unite is, is absolutely committed to fighting against the uh, racist filth that's peddled by the hard right. Uh, uh, we organise uh, migrant <laughs> labour. Uh, we have links with our trade unions in Eastern Europe, in Poland and Romania, and uh, etc., in order to try and protect workers. Wherever workers come from, they need protection. Great, thank you. I'll take one final question. Um, over here in the corner, if you can get the mic down there. Hi. So I just want to ask about accountability within Unite as a whole. So um, in the three elections that you've won, um, to be General Secretary of a union, turnout never exceeded 16%. Um, most recently, um, less than one in eight people turned up to vote in the Unite leadership election. Um, even then you did win by five and a half thousand votes, but against kind of a total membership unite of 1.3 million, that sort of seems like quite a small amount. Um, but before the votes had actually been counted in your campaign, you'd already suspended your leadership rival from the union for bringing it into disrepute after he um, drew attention to sort of criticism of, of your purchase of a flat using 400,000 pounds of your union's money, um, which was a decision that obviously being criticized by several other executives within Unite. So I just kind of, kind of asked like, is there genuine accountability within your union? And does this sort of perception, this sort of negative headlines that generate not sort of damage the labor movement as a whole? Well, let me correct you on a number of those things. First of all, I didn't take 400,000 pounds from my union. So that was peddled during the um, general secretary election. I've won three elections and the last one that was peddled, the amounts of money that my opponents at the time received from big business and the backing from the right-wing media was incredible. Nobody's ever seen a general secretary election, not in the whole of the trade union movement, uh, like it before. Why was it? Well, because primarily the establishment were trying to bring down Jeremy Corbyn, and they believed that by bringing Lynn McCluskey down, they could also get two birds with one stone and bring down um, Jeremy Corbyn as well. Now, they failed on both accounts. Uh, the fact is that I didn't sack or suspend um, uh, my opponents. Uh, I was, I, there was an acting general secretary <coughs> at the time who took that decision. Uh, you, you can believe it or not at face value. No input from me whatsoever. There are certain procedures in any organization, in, in, presumably including your own, about how you can conduct yourself. Um, and those procedures were felt by the executive members and by the acting general secretary to be uh, an outrage and something that needed to be dealt with. People said it should have been dealt with during the election campaign. In other words, you should have been disqualified. Um, I uh, 
didn't want that to happen, although I didn't have a say in it. But I did make it clear that I didn't think that was the right thing to do. It was when the campaign was over, uh, when he'd lost, that the uh, incursions against the rules of the union that had been so blatant and so <coughs> evident and so damning, um, uh, the process was kicked off and he was, um, he was uh, went through due process and was sacked. He subsequently lost any industrial tribunal. He then took uh, a claim to the certification officer. Certification officers are government uh, appointed individual who are known to not be friendly to left-wing unions and he lost on all accounts. Um, so don't believe everything you read in the newspapers, but let me then come to a much more important point that you make, and that's about turnout. The democratic deficit that exists in election turnouts is appalling. Do you think for one minute that I'm happy that 15% uh, of, of Unite members actually vote in the election for a general secretary, or indeed uh, not sufficient people vote um, in industrial action issues? Absolutely not. I've appealed consistently to Tory uh, Prime Ministers, uh, both David Cameron and uh, Theresa May, and now Boris Johnson, that they should do away with postal ballots. Postal ballots are notorious for turning out low uh, turnouts. They, they are always low. You talk about Unite, you can pick any union, any union. One of my colleagues has just been elected as General Secretary with a 5% turnout. What we've argued for in order to cr close that democratic deficit is to allow voting at work, to allow uh, workers to vote in their working environment with proper, properly protected and secret ballots, but at their workplace. If that was to happen, then the turnout on elections would shoot up in excess of 70%. When we have workplace ballots for our shop stewards, actually at the workplace, and shop stewards are elected on 70, 80, 90, sometimes 100% turnouts because people are in work. And of course, when I pointed out to Theresa May that uh, she herself was elected by a workplace ballot in Parliament, the MPs voted for her physically in Parliament. They voted physically for Boris Johnson in Parliament, for him and um, um, the other guy whose name I forgot to be on the ballot paper that then went to the, the members. But it was in work ballots that actually produce. So I'm as concerned about low turnouts as, as any, anybody else. And the way to overcome that democratic <coughs> deficit is to have uh, ballots within the workplace. But try not to believe too much you read in the Daily Mail or, or, or the Sunday Times. Great. With that, I'll ask you to join me in thanking Len McCoskey.